walk, bike, horseback ride, or even take the tram tour, but the only way to see the deer, elk, longhorn, and bison is via tram. We're getting ready for our nature walk to discover edible plants around the park. Oh, I'll tear up, tear up leaves. It's really yeah. strong to eat it. So like when I'm making a green salad, I'll just throw a few little torn up pieces into that, and then you get one of those little bites, and it just mm -hmm. little pep up the salad. I think if we come to your house for dinner this evening, uh, <laughs> we're going to be like, we're going to be healthy when we leave. <laughs> you just missed out on a world class event that they do. Uh, uh, I've done two of them with. It's, uh, it's in Fayetteville, Arkansas, called the um, uh, Apple Seeds Teaching Farm. Mm -hmm. And they do a lot of work with kids, getting, you know, showing them how things grow and, and gardening and all that kind of stuff. But they recently got into the, they call it a wild table event. So they get me and another guy, Eric, Eric Fusilier, he's kind of the Northwest Arkansas native plant specialist and uh, foraging guy too. And then they'll get Jay Pitts, who's the mushroom, kind of the mushroom god in Northwest Arkansas and then a nutritionist and she knows all of the which i cover a lot of that too but all the medicinal stuff and nutrition that's contained in the wild plants that you just can't buy in the store yeah and uh then they they have a rotating chef each event so the 
couple of days before, me and all the rest of the instructors go out and just collect whatever's available. We just get bags and bags of greens and fruit, I mean, whatever's out there. And then we bring it to him at about noon on the day of the event. And then at three o'clock, we do a, a edible plant walk with a group. They, they limit it to 30 people. So we have to break it up into groups. You know, like two instructors will take one half of the group, two will take the other half. And then we'll do a part of the walk and then switch. So each group gets a little, you know, yeah. taste of it each instructor then they all go back and then we do a speaking thing about talking about what we do you know each year and i talk about my book and whatnot and then you sit down to like a six course meal of stuff that you would not believe mm -hmm. i mean it's just <laughs> i i can't i mean it's so flavorful like i said stuff that you just can't buy in the store i'll show you the menu that we it was just last sunday and we did another one back in may that was and they they fill up within the the first day when they do them. It's like uh, okay, it's cocktail sumac margarita with honey locust bees knee, and the, that was made with honey locust uh, syrup out of the pods. Uh, the honey locust has its pods. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you, there's an amber gooey stuff in there. It's just like honey, and you, and you collect a bunch of that to make another cocktail. I brought the sumac berries. The appetizer was uh, forged and fermented wild pickled edibles. I made those too. It was uh, just these that is on the cover of my book, the, the uh, ground plums and daylily bugs. It's orange ditch lilies, they call them. There. Mm -hmm. hmm. uh, That's probably one you want to get to know. You might know that one. No. The old saying, leaf with the three, a poison let it be. Yeah. One of the things you look for in poison ivy, they always have three leaflets, but the centered leaflet, uh -huh. yeah, leaflet is always on a longer stem than the two side leaflets. And it's one of the most variable plants I know. It, it can be a smooth edge, it can be notched, it can almost be serrated. And you can see that one has really deep notches in it. And uh, it can be a ground cover, an upright shrub like this, or a vine going way up a tree and getting enormous. familiarize yourself if you're allergic to it. If you look off to the left, you'll see this spring water log in here. This is called Little Indian Creek. At the far end of the parking lot is Hobbs Creek. And up farther, we're going to be going along Dogwood Creek. Look at it from the left hand side. If you want to get photos of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, see what happens when you wait on <laughs> Now, if you haven't noticed, I'm actually throwing fish food out for them. Oh, get back in there, baby. Uh oh, there you go. These little trout here are about four to five pounds, so I'm a little bit smaller. We actually have another spot up. You're going to be able to feed yourself. They go up to 10 pounds. These are rainbow trout. They will only last in cold water like this. And its water temperature is 55 to 65 degrees year round. Pretty chilly. There you go. Nice. Smile. No, okay. Can I pay the fee? And Please, yes. Don't be shy. Don't eat it. Now, if you are a photographer. See where the blue grain is going to be. The shallower, like this on the right hand side of me here, that's going to be more clear, more lighter brown color. But that is clear water, actually. If you take a glass full of that, it's going to be pretty clear. Mm -hmm. 
If you see Jane there, Jane is a female. She can have up to three babies if she wanted to, instead of triplets. If you look to the right, first of all, that is our longhorn steer. They actually originated out of Spain. And were brought to the New World, or Haiti, by Christopher Columbus on his second voyage. Yeah, we'll get up close to them in a minute. And then they went from uh, Haiti, they went to Mexico, and then from Mexico, they, some of them ran away, got wild, and went into Texas. Some Texas ranchers actually herded them up, bred them with their cattle, and that's how we got the Texas Longhorn Steer. This one, close to you see here, you can see his horns are straighter than the other two. And he was nicknamed George Straight because of his straight horn. <laughs> Those guys will weigh between 1,400 and 2,000 pounds. That's a lot of steak or hamburger. Here, the first one, he's probably about a two, two and a half year old. The one just on the other side of him, he's got two little stubs on his head. He's a one year old. They will stay with the females until they're about two and a half years old or a little bit older. Then they will go with the male herd. During the rut season, they'll actually get pushed away from all the females so the dominant male can create his own harem of females. Then after rut system or breeding season, then they will go back right back with the females again, with the cows. They are called cows at this age. When they have a baby, it's called a calf. Again, they will shed off each year and immediately after they shed off, they will start regrowing again. That's Hercules. <laughs> He's our dominant bull this last year. He is majestic looking, isn't he? He's the father of, was supposed to be about 14 babies. Right now we have nine out there, I think. He's going over to get the water. That's where he's going. Okay, off to our left here, this is our white bison. If you notice by his eye color, he is white and not albino. Albino would be red colored. He is two years old. We just got him from a private ranch in Moscow Mills, Missouri. His name is Takota, spelled with a T. And in the Sioux language, it means friend to all. We hope he will become our dominant bull here in the future. In the Indian nation, a white buffalo means very sacred to him. That means things will hopefully come in plenty with no disasters at hand. In a white bison, there's only one in every 10 million bison that are born are born white. Even if you had a white female to go with that male, you couldn't promise that you'd ever get a white baby out of it. Both the male and female bison have horns. The only way to tell the difference in between the two is if you see one nursing off the female or unless you look at the undercarriage. <laughs> As they're born, they're actually called red dog. I have a home. This big bull here, that's Ninja. That's the next bull that's gonna take over for Hercules. Again, Hercules is getting a little older. It's okay, baby. It's okay. It's all right. This one isn't that old yet. When they're about a month old, they start getting horns already. This one does not have any horns yet. You see a couple of them grunting at you there.
when they're born they can actually run full speed with the rest of the herd? Well, let's see where he, he wants to get with the other crew. That's what he's trying to do. <laughs> that mom's a little upset to stay away from my baby. As you can see, we got several babies out there. If you can look at this one right in front of his ears there, he's got two little horns coming out. There's another one on the other side, got his little horns are started. They'll start growing within a month period of time. They can actually run right with the rest of the herd as soon as they're born. And a bison can run faster than a horse, 30 to 35 miles an hour. They can jump vertically six foot straight in the air. Yeah. No, my daughter